Let me just ask kind of an introductory question, uh, what you're afraid of this morning. You ever think about what you're afraid of? Uh, it changes at different stages in life. We all have different fears as we're young and as we grow older. How many remember when you were a child that your room became a different place when the lights went out? Remember that? And the only thing that you really feared what was either inside of your closet or under your bed. And do you remember that when you were in bed, you could never let your arm hang over the edge of the bed? Because something or somebody was under there, probably your little brother, to grab your hand, right, and pull you under. And then you get a little bit older, you're not afraid of that anymore. When you're a teenager, what are you afraid of when you're a teenager? Let's just be honest. Nothing. I'm a teenager. I fear nothing, all right? And uh, then you get into your 20s, and your fears change a little bit in your 20s. You wonder, uh, maybe a fear for you is, will I get married? Um, Will I ever get married? Will I marry somebody that looks like my dad or looks like my mom or whatever? And then you get older in life and maybe you fear that someday you're going to get old enough that you wear black socks with your sandals. I don't know. Fears just change all the time in life, right? So fears change. But as we get into this series, I want to tell you what you really need to fear. And all of us are candidates for this one thing that we're going to talk about for the next couple of weeks. In fact, the thing that we should fear the most, we should fear the most because it has eternal consequences. There's a lot of things we can fear in life. We can fear a phone call or a letter from the IRS. We can fear health concerns. We can fear all kinds of different things. But the one thing that we should fear the most is the thing that affects us spiritually because it has eternal consequences. And that thing is called drifting. And drifting, we just drift away from God. And drifting just happens so subtly. We don't even know that it's happening. We just start to move away from God and we can one time be so close to God. We've all been into church service where, man, there was something happening and it was just this electric environment. And we were there and we stood at the front or we knelt at the steps or an altar up front or we were at our chair and we just had tears going and snot going and we had our hands upraised. And in that moment, sin seemed like the stupidest thing in the world. Like if somebody said, hey, when church is done, want to go sin? You would have said, what? No, I'm just loving Jesus. And you were so close to God in that moment. And then, then something happened one day. And you found yourself in a place where you said, God, where are you? What happened to you? And God would say, well, really, nothing happened to me. Something seems to have happened to you. I remember as kids when we would go camping out here at Lake Sakakawea. I grew up here, and we'd go camping at Lake Sakakawea. And it was always a, a great example going out there. I just I, I hated the whole camping experience, still hate it to this day. Camping is nature's way of promoting the hotel industry, right? That's, that's the whole thing on camping. You need to know and understand. Because when we went camping, there was no RV, baby. There was no satellite TV, no shower in the camper. When we went camping, it was a tent and a roll of toilet paper. I mean, that was camping, right? So we'd get out there and go camping, and Mom and Dad would pitch the tent along the shore, and they kind of get camp going. And while they were doing that, we'd change into our swim trunks, swimsuits, whatever, and uh, we'd go out in the water. Now, now, my oldest sister, this is funny because my oldest sister is the shortest in the family, but she was the sacrificial lamb because she was the oldest, right? And she took it upon herself to go find a long, straight stick, and she'd wander out in the water, and she'd start feeling with her feet because she's looking for the drop-off because there's a drop-off out there. So you kind of wander out there and walk out there and walk out there, and then you'd feel with your feet, you'd feel that drop off, and then she'd back up a little bit and plunge the stick down. You see the stick coming out of the water, right? This is the safe zone. Here's the tent. Here's the stick. We'll just play right in here, and everything would be great. And so we'd go out there and play and splash in the water and choke down some good Missouri River water. It was just an awesome time. And we, I remember this one time specifically. We were playing, having this incredible time in the water, and when the play was over, I, I stopped and I looked up. I thought, why did mom and dad move the tent? I thought the tent was cool where it was at. Why did they move the tent? That didn't make any sense at all. And then I started looking around, and not only did the tent move, the stick moved too. Well, you all know what happened. I'm in the Missouri River. The tent hadn't gone anywhere. The stick hadn't gone anywhere. I was being swept down the stream just ever so gently without realizing that I was being drifted and carried along. Now, here's what drifting looks like for us. Spiritually, when you leave this church today, when you leave this church, you're going to walk out this set of doors, you're going to go out another set of doors. And when you leave this building today, you're going to enter into the stream of life. You're going to enter into a river. And in that river, not coursing water through the channels, but rather coursing the world systems, the world values, the things that are important to the world. That's the culture that we live in. That's the stream that we wade through. 
And when you step outside of the doors of this church today, it's like you're going to leave the safety of the banks of the river and you're going to walk into the waters. And ultimately for all of us in this room, our goal, our goal, our destination is to get to the other side of the river. And that would be the end of this life that we know and understand, this physical life that we live, that one day this body dies and there's another life beyond this. But in order to get to the destination, we have to make it across the river. And all of us, all of us in this room are candidates for drifting away from God. And we drift away from God when we get involved and influenced by the culture that we live in. When we begin to just pick up our feet and drift with the waters. And this is what what drifting looks like for any of us and all of us that are in this room today. And I'm telling you again, all of us are candidates. All of us are candidates to drift away from God. And I see it on people's connection cards. I see that people write down that they want to get reconnected with God again. They want to get close to God again. Something's missing and I want to redevelop my spiritual life. And I'm just telling you that they have become a candidate. They become a victim in so many ways of just drifting. And drifting kind of looks like this for us. We'll we'll say something like this. Well, hey, you know, and here I come and I found this incredible church and it's fun and I love this church family. And then I don't see somebody for a while. It's like, where have you been? Well... I got this job, see, and uh, the job, I get like one weekend off, and I don't get to be here very often, and the one weekend that I do get off, man, I'm just so wiped out, I'm so tired, and it's, it's time with the family, and we just decided to spend some time together, so we'll take off and go back home, or go to Bismarck, we go to Minot, we just go somewhere, and we just spend that time away, and oh, uh, well, I haven't seen you for a long time. Where have you been? Well, I met this guy, and he's really not into church. Like, I mean, he believes in God, and he's got a Bible, and wears a cross, and all that stuff. We talk about God, and all, but he's just not into church, and I'm trying to witness to him and share my faith with him and stuff, and I'll, I'll get him here. Well, I met this girl, and well, you know, we kind of just been hanging out and finding our thing to do. Well, I haven't seen you for a while. Where have you been? Well, you know, we um, bought a cabin. Now we got a boat, and you know how winters are in North Dakota, and you only get so many weekends to be on the boat and enjoy the cabin. And so we like to just go hang out, and we just feel so connected to God in nature, drifting on my boat. Yeah, you're drifting all right, buddy, okay? Right? <laughs> Haven't seen you for a long time. Where have you been? Well, you know, we're just busy. We had a wedding, and then there was a graduation, and then uh, somebody came to town, and we took them here, and we went here, and well, then this was a time for us to be away, and just on and on and on and on and on. I'm just telling you, if any of you, if that is your story, you're a candidate. You're a candidate for drifting, and I don't care how much you know about God. You could be, you could be, you could grown up in the church, you could read the Bible all the time. I don't care how much you know about God, you could still, you could still drift. I don't care how close you've been to God in a relationship. I don't care how close you are right now in a relationship with God. You're still a candidate for drifting. And in a moment, we're going to look at the life of a character, a very famous character in the Word of God, who drifted. And here's how drifting happened. It just begins with a thought. It's just one decision that we make. It wasn't like anybody got out of bed today and said, you know what, today's the 3rd of August. I think I'm just going to walk away from God today. I think I'm just going to put him behind me and I'm going to go do my thing for a little while. None of us gets out of bed and makes that decision. But all of us make one little decision that seems so insignificant, so inconsequential. And we then become the candidate to start drifting down the stream. And drifting becomes the unintended consequence for us when we have no intention of not drifting. And so this guy named Solomon is who we're going to talk about this morning. Solomon is an amazing guy. Solomon is the son of David. Solomon gets to be the king of Israel at its zenith, at its high point. Solomon has encounters with God. He's got at least two visions with God where God comes and speaks to him, not like some impression like he was looking at his alphabet soup and the letters stirred around and God spoke something to him. I mean, God talked to Solomon. In a dream, God speaks to Solomon and says, I'll give you whatever you ask for. If you want wealth, riches, long life, whatever. And Solomon says, you know, I'm just, I'm leading a great people, God. You know what I need more than anything? I just need wisdom. God blesses him with wisdom. And even in this incredible relationship that Solomon had with God, with a pedigree like David, King David is my dad, Solomon still was a drifter. 
We read today in 1 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse number 29, a little of the back history here with Solomon. Here's what it says. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sands of the seashore. I mean, if there was a guy in the Bible that had it all, Solomon, he had the looks, he had the charisma, he had the wealth, He had the people around him. He had the wisdom of God. He had the resources of God. Solomon had it all. He had it all. But Solomon made made some very critical and crucial choices. He began a life that started him to drift. And it's an amazing thing. It could seem so inconsequential. We could read right over the verse. We could read right beyond the lines as we read these things about Solomon. And the one decision, the one choice that Solomon made that put him in the drifting mode was getting involved with the wrong woman, all right? That's just where the whole thing started. So we're going to read about that, that twice, twice God appears to Solomon. It's an incredible encounter he has with him, but it all began in in a decision that seems strategic. In fact, it reads like this in 1 Kings 3, 1, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, And he married his daughter. Now, God probably warned him, look, Solomon, you know better than this. I've warned you. I've warned your people. I've warned your ancestors. Don't you intermarry with them. Don't you get involved with those kind of women. I'm just telling you, Solomon, how many many of you guys, when you started dating a girl and your mama said, we don't date those kind of girls because you know where they come, the other side of the tracks, okay, whatever that was, and there's... Families on the other side of the track saying, we don't date those kind of people. They're from the other side, whatever. And Solomon had the warning, you just don't go out with girls like that. And Solomon here, all he does, this is a, this is a military strategy. If I want to make an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, I'll just marry his daughter. He's not going to go to war against a nation where, I mean, this is where my daughter lives. And God would say to Solomon, look, Solomon, this is the beginning of the end for you. This is not going to have good consequences. No, 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 no. God, look, look, look. You don't understand? Look, this isn't a love thing. I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to rule the kingdom. Don't try to rule my life. You're not the boss of me. I know what I'm doing. I can handle this. This is just a military strategy. There's no love interest involved here. I mean, after all, look at her. Well, I don't know what he said. But he's trying to rationalize this whole thing somewhere along the line with God. And it's, just, it's just one little Egyptian girl, and we'll make a Jew out of her. You just watch, God. You see, you'll see what we do. And God says, don't do this. And Solomon says, look, I, I don't care what you say, God. It's just one. It's just one. It's just one. The narrative reads on about Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 says... Uh, King Solomon, however, he loved many foreign women. Many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. I mean, you know about these kind of girls, don't you? You've read about the Sidonians and Hittites all the time, right? Okay. Verse number two says, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after other gods. God's warning them, look, God knew God has a different perspective on Solomon and on Israel and on you and on me than we have on ourselves. Solomon, look, look, you say just one, but I know it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. One is going to lead to two. Two is going to lead to three. Three is going to lead to four and five. And pretty soon, as we're going to read, he had 700 wives. Read this story. I know you're thinking, really? Yeah, this is a historical account. Read this. Not only did he have 700 wives, he had 300 concubines. Guys, a thousand women in his life, right? They all led his heart astray. We're going to read that in just a moment. I wonder if you can remember being warned by somebody significant in your life about a decision, a choice that you were about to make. Really sure about that job? You really sure about the job? I mean, have you done some research about the business? Yeah, 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 yeah. I I can just just get in. I'm going to get out. I know what I'm doing. It's all okay. It's going to work out. Are you sure you want to marry him? 
I mean, maybe your friend said something to you. I mean, are you sure you want to get, did you, do you remember how he treated you the other night? Do you remember, I remember listening to you as we just talked as friends, what kind of guy you were going to marry. You had all of these standards. And you wanted to marry a guy that was this and this and this and this. Well, we were out the other night and I watched him and I watched him with her and I watched him with you. Are you sure you want to get into I know what I'm doing. I can handle this. I can handle him. Are you sure she's the one for you? Yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure. Are you sure you want to go into debt for this? Are you sure you want to buy this? Yeah, I know what I'm doing. I know exactly how to invest my money here. I can get in and get out and keep my shirt. I know what I'm doing. And I know this one thing might be wrong. I know this, but look, I can, I can handle it. And the pastor starts talking to you, and you look, you go, look, pastor, look, it's none of your business, none of your business. I know what I'm doing in this relationship. Just leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. Just leave me alone. Look, I know I have no business getting involved in this marriage and marrying this kind of a person. I know I have no business doing that, but just, just pastor, just leave me alone on this. I have no business getting involved in this, this, this investment. I know, Pastor, but look, it's just a one-time deal. It's not a big deal. I'm going to get in, and I'll give 10% to the church. <laughs> and just leave me alone, Pastor. You start to sound like my mom, you know? Yeah. And I, I know that I have no doing, business doing it, but it's just going to be this one time. And you make this, here's the incredible thing. This is, this is the deception of drifting. This is the deception of drifting because you make this one little insignificant decision about the relationship or the finances or a moral decision and you make this decision on Monday and guess what happens on Tuesday? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you get up Wednesday and Wednesday looks like Tuesday and Tuesday looks like Monday. And the rest of the week they all starts to look alike and you're thinking there's no big deal. So I made the decision. There's no consequences. Until suddenly, somewhere along the line, a tragedy strikes. And suddenly you don't know where to go. And you're saying, God, where are you? And God's saying, look, I ain't gone anywhere. Look around. Look where the tent is. Look where the stick is. I didn't move. You did. And it's so subtle. It's so easy to be caught off guard. What you've done when you make a decision to make a compromise, a moral compromise, a spiritual compromise in your life, you know what you've done? You've just planted a seed like Solomon did. You just planted a seed and the seed begins to grow. And there's something that's harvested from that seed. And after Solomon married this one woman, what you need to understand is that Solomon marries this one woman. Maybe he had a couple others. I don't know. What it, he hadn't gone too far into the whole marriage thing. And he builds this temple to God. I mean, I still love God. And Solomon loves God. And he builds this temple, what would become one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And I, I think I'm still in tune with God. I mean, look, I built this temple. But he's already started the process of drifting. And besides Pharaoh's daughters, we just read, he married Moabites and Ammonites and Edomites and Sidonians and Hittites from all these nations about which the Lord had warned him. And how did he get, how did he get from just one wife to 700? How did he get from one to 700? It just started with a thought. I'm the king of Israel. I need an alliance with the king of Egypt. And I think I know how to cement this thing. I know he's got some girls living under his roof. I think I'll just marry one of them. If I just marry one, we can create this alliance. Well, guess what? Israel was surrounded by more than one nation. Surrounded by a lot of nations. Surrounded by a lot of nations that had no regard, no reverence for the deity in the existence of God, Solomon knew him. And so he started out with one. It just started out with a thought. And it always starts out with a thought with us. Our minds are so incredibly powerful. And we, we think about the thought long enough until the thought becomes an action. And then the thought and the action kind of go together, and it kind of creates this attitude inside of us. Because, you know, guess what? I made this one decision. I made this one compromise today. And guess what happened? Nothing. I'm cheating the system. <laughs> I can get by with this and nothing will happen. 
And God starts to confront Solomon. What are you doing marrying all these women? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. God, 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 wait, wait. See that big building out there? I built that for you. Remember, I ain't gone anywhere. I still know who you are. Don't get on my case about stuff. The process of drifting away for all of us, just like it was for Solomon, is so incredibly subtle. Never underestimate the power of drifting away from God. What if I would have warned you about some of the things, some of the tragedies that you've gone through in your life? What if I would have warned you about the relationship that ended in divorce? What if I would have warned you about the financial decision that you made that got you to the place where you are today? What if I would have warned you about the guy or the girl that you're living with right now? And now you're in a situation that you wish it wasn't like it is. And you on out, you wish you could change. There's some regret and some remorse. What if I would have warned you? You know what would have happened if I would have warned you? You would have said, look, 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 it's going to be okay. You don't know him like I know him. You don't know her like I know her. It's all going to work out all right. (laughs) All of us are candidates to drift away. Pastor, it's just one date, one drink, one smoke, one time away from church. It's just... Just stop acting like my mom, would you? Leave me alone. (laughs) And I love it whenever I go to the grocery store, and if I haven't seen you, now you're here this Sunday morning, so you know it's coming, and I go to the store, and I see you, and you see through the corner of the aisle, and you're in aisle five right away, aren't you? (laughs) I know what he's going to ask me. It's like the the word, the last word. When I've been away from church, the last person I want to see is the pastor. It's like, oh, the pastor, you know. (laughs) You know, kids, mess your diaper or something so that we can just have an excuse to move on. We've got to have a reason to go. You dread seeing the pastor, right? Just leave me alone. I know that I've done some things wrong. Well, fortunately, there's hope at the end of this message because I'm telling you again, all of us are candidates for the same thing. But look what happens to Solomon in chapter 11, verse 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God. I mean, I, I, I know who God is. I still wear a cross necklace once in a while or cross earrings and got a cross tattoo and still have the Bible on the shelf in my house. And, you know, I still, you know, listen to K-Love once in a while and not fully devoted like you once were. It goes on to say in verse number 9 that the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. Why was he angry? He was angry because how can I have this communion, this fellowship, this intimacy, this closeness with you and you've wandered away. I just want you back. And Solomon should have been getting older and wiser. He just got older and, forgive me, stupider. He followed the gods of these wives, even building churches after the gods of these women. Not only did he build this temple to God, as you read in the course of time, he starts to put up all these buildings, erecting all these buildings to worship to these foreign gods. And as we read the narrative about Solomon, it seems like it began with just one choice, one decision. And when he first became king, and you would have told him, look, Solomon, this is great. Inauguration day, man. Israel's all excited about you, David, your dad. We just love David, your dad. Now you're king. and This is awesome. And God's appeared to you twice. And you have this incredible wisdom. Wow, this is just an amazing day. But let me just tell you something. You're going to marry one foreign woman, and she's going to lead you to 700 more. Solomon would have said, What? No, 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 no. No, I pretty much know the course of my life. I know where things are going. But you understand that God has a different perspective of your life than you do. Parents, you understand this because you've made the mistakes your kids made. And so you start to hover over your kids and you want to know how they drive and you're watching them through the window as they back out of the driveway and you're watching them when they're talking and interacting with other friends and you just hover over their lives and you want to see who they're with online. And you have a perspective of their life that they don't have. They're thinking like, bug off already. You have to watch everything I do. You watch me eat. You watch me when I listen to music. You just watch, watch, watch all the time. But we understand as parents that we made mistakes at your age. 
We had a different perspective. And so God, God looks at us as adults and says, or all of us, and says, look, I have a different perspective than you do. I see the past, I see the present, and I am in the future as well. I can see the potential collisions. I see the crash that's about to happen. You can pick him if you want to. You can do that if you want to. You can read that. You can pick that up if you want to. But I know the outcome. You say you're in charge. You say you're in control. You say this won't affect me. But I know you better than you know yourself. You see how easy it is for any and all of us to drift away. And some of you are sitting here this morning saying, I would never do that. If you say that, then you're a candidate for drifting. We make decisions that just begins with a decision. It's just a thought that turns into an attitude. And you know what happens to us when we get into the drifting process? I mean, when we're in full drift mode now. We're in full drift mode. Somewhere along the line, we want to carry God with us because we like God in our hip pocket. Because we never know there might be a tragedy, there might be a crisis, so I'll just stick God in my hip pocket and we start to flow with the culture. We start to think like the culture. We are not counterculture at all. We just want to go along with the culture. We're just going to go and God's in my hip pocket and God, you just come along with me. You, I just, whatever I'm doing, I want you there. And then sometimes I don't want you there, but I kind of want you there. And God, don't you look at the sin in my life, just look at the offering I gave on Sunday morning. I mean, you know, or God, look at my life, look at my life, and, and don't, don't look at the bad things I'm doing. Just, like, look at the good I'm doing, and hopefully the good outweighs the bad, and you'll accept me and take me in. We're in full drift mode at that point in time. That should be, that should be a red flag. That should be a warning for us. And there's a lot of different red flags and warnings all of us should have in our life. If somebody starts to ask you some questions at work, at home, you have to tell a lie. Drifting. That's a red flag. Because see, when you were so close to God, when you were having this amazing altar experience, when you were having this incredible fellowship with God, when your devotional time and your Bible reading time and your prayer time and your church time was hot and on fire, you'd never even imagine or dream about lying. When, when you get into that situation where Something tragic happens in your life. Suddenly there's a death, there's a loss, there's an accident, there's a diagnosis. Something has happened and you're scrambling trying to find just the right Bible passage. And, oh God, where are you? And what's happening? That, that should be a red flag. You're, you've drifted. You panic instead of having peace. There's some things you need to know about drifting. We'll talk more about it next week and we'll talk about some answers to kind of combat the drifting tendency that all of us can face day by day. That the culture that we live in is the current in the stream. It's where we live. And when you're in church on a Sunday morning, this is like a rock in the middle of the stream. Like this is a safe place and it ought to be. You can cling to that rock. You come here on a Sunday morning and it's fantastic. It's phenomenal. And we're here just worshiping God and I feel such a presence and such a peace in this place. And this is fun. This is good. But the moment church is done and you walk out the doors again, you're going to walk right back into that culture. And there's some laws about the current that pull us away and cause us to drift. Some of the laws that you need to know and understand is this, that, that if, you, if you give in to the current, you're going to think things are going to get easier for you. If I just give in, if I just give in, if I make the moral decisions and just give in, if I enter into that conversation with them, if I just start to think and act like the rest of the world around me, it's just going to get easier. And you know what? It does get easier. For a while. For a while. But you understand this about the culture that you live in. Wherever you decide to take a moral stand, wherever you dig in your heels, that's where your battle is going to begin. When you're in the workplace and all of a sudden the conversation comes up that makes you very uncomfortable and you know you need to say something. What do I do? Do I stay silent? Do I keep quiet or do I say something? If you want to say something, you can, but you understand you've already gone along with the culture a little bit and you're starting to drift. And for you to say something now is going to be very awkward and very difficult. So the deception of the stream is that it's going to be easier if you just give in and go along with it, and it is for a while. But wherever you draw that line in your morals, 
Wherever you draw the line in relationships, wherever you draw the line in your habits and your activities and in your thought life, wherever you draw that line, that's where the battle begins for all of us. It's time for us to say, you know what? I'm not going to get involved with that guy. I'm not going to get involved with that girl. I'm not going to move in with them. I'm not going to have that relationship with them. I'm not going to go to that party. I'm not going to involve myself in that kind of activity. I'm just not going to go there. That's where your battle is going to begin. But the temptation for any and all of us is that, you know what? If I just lift my feet and go for a little while, it's just going to get easier because I don't want to fight the battle. That's the second thing you need to know and understand about this culture that we live in is that the further downstream you dig in your heels, the harder it is to take your stand. Let me ask you this, which is easier, to never turn on the TV set or to try to turn it off in the middle of what you shouldn't be watching? Which is easier, to never get into the relationship or to try to break it off after you've already given your heart and probably a little bit more? Which is easier, to never go to the website or to try to get out of the website after you've already been there? What's easiest for you, to, to never start that habit or to try to stop it in the middle when it's already got a pull in your heart? All of us are candidates for drifting. We just think if I give in, it's going to be a lot easier. But here's what you need to understand, that the further downstream you get, the closer to the waterfall you get. And the closer you are to the waterfall, the, the closer you are to the point of no return, the harder it is to fight that current. Which leads us then to the third thing you need to know and understand about drifting. There comes a place in many people's lives where they say, you know what, I am so close to the edge. I've lifted my feet. I've drifted with the culture. I'm so far down the line. You know what, I'm just going to lift my feet and go all the way because it doesn't matter anymore. I've already gone so far down the stream. I've already drifted so far away from God. I've already committed sins and I've already done things and I've already lived the lifestyle. And I've made the choices that honestly, if I were God, I would never take me back. So I'll just, I'll just, I'm, I'm done. And I just quit and I just give up. Maybe that's exactly why you're in church on a Sunday morning. You're hoping, you're hoping above hopes and beyond hope that there's a God that will receive you back. And I'm going to tell you just right now that there is. That all of us, while we're candidates for drifting, we're candidates to be brought back into a relationship of vitality with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe you've gotten to the place in your life where you say, I'm so ashamed of where drifting has taken me. But are you ashamed or are you embarrassed? Because if you're embarrassed, it's probably not much is going to change in your life. But if you get to the place of shame saying, I recognize, I know that I need to stop this right now. I need to get back on the course. I need to stop drifting. I need to get to the other side of this river. I need to get to the goal and the destination. And there's Jesus on the other side. Come, swim. Come on. You can do this. You can do this. Come on. Come on. And he's up there saying, come on. And he's throwing the lifeline and the rope to you. And he's waiting for you to grab hold of it so he can help you across there. But you have to make the decision to do that. Because if you make the decision to grab the lifeline, you're a candidate for the grace of God. He's reaching out to you today saying, come home. I want you to finish the race. Finish strong. You can do this. Come on. Come on. And he's cheering you on. Don't you give up. Don't you quit on this relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he's never quit or given up on you. Today is the day to say, Lord, man, why, why did I come to church today? <laughs> I was hoping for like a happy message. <laughs> this is a message of hope. And it was written for you because I'm just sharing with you the sincerity of my heart today. I want you to make it across the river. I don't want you to drift away from God. I just love you and care about you too much. We talk about the things that we fear, should fear. The, thing, the one thing we should fear the most is drifting away from God because it has eternal consequences telling you today, in just a few moments, we're going to open up the front. We're going to have some music going. Pastor Jordan's coming. And we're just going to just enter in and get right back on track again. And we're going to say, God, I've been far. I want to get close. And you know what? When I, I start to feel like I've drifted, church, look, all of us are candidates for drifting. 
And when I feel like I've started to drift away from God, I just look for some magic formula like, God, oh God, I'm looking for the service and the worship and the song and whatever it is. And then God reminds me of a Bible verse that has this incredibly simple principle. God says this, draw near to God. Some of you can finish it for me and he'll draw near to you. It's not rocket science, but it's hard work. And it takes daily effort. And if we don't make a daily effort to stay connected to God, the unintended consequence is we become a candidate for drifting. Let's pray. 